and surveillance and monitoring of diabetes in the population. It's a great pleasure for me to, to welcome you to this special event and to our speakers of this webinar. Also, thank you very much to the University of Antioquia, to the Florida International University, to the Americas Network for Chronic Disease Surveillance, to the Repositorio de las Americas, and to the American Diabetes Station, who are collaborators in this webinar. Please, uh, some basic rules and guidance for this webinar. I ask you to stay muted and keep your webcams off. The session recording will be available in about between three and seven days after the webinar. We will send you a link of how to access later on the recordings. I also encourage you, if you have any questions for the speakers, um, please submit your questions at Q&A, the question and answer box. And after the last presentation, we're going to take the questions. So we won't ask, answer questions un until the last, very last presentation. So we should have about 30 minutes for answering questions from the audience. A couple of words about the America's Network for Chronic Disease Surveillance. Um, we exist since 2003. Uh, we have worked to reduce non-communicable diseases and to improve the surveillance and monitoring processes for non-communicable disease and the risk factors in the regions of the Americas and the Caribbean. So it's all about the Americas. We are a nonprofit organization, NGO, and we promote the integration of governmental and non-governmental organizations for advanced professional training in epidemiological surveillance, case management, prevention, and the control of non-communicable diseases and the risk factors. As we're an NGO, usually in the webinars we offer in our activities for free, we usually rely on, on donations. If you visit our webpage on www.redimnet.org, we have, a, that's the most important button we have on our webpage, it's called Donar, which in Spanish means to donate. So we accept all kinds of contributions, I mean, in kind or as well, if you like to participate in activities in Omnet, we, you're more than welcome to be integrated in our activities. This is the program of today. We have four um, famous and very well um, known speakers. We're going to first talk about the challenge of undiagnosed diabetes in the population by Dr. Catherine Orguzova. Then, Jako Tuomilecht, we're going to talk about surveillance of diabetes in the Finnish population, followed by surveillance of diabetes in South America by Professor Pablo Aschner. And we're going to finalize a webinar with a talk on surveillance of diabetes in the US by Ed Craig, who's now working in the UK, he changed the countries and before uh, he could travel and to the UK. These are our presenters, so all really um, the experts in their fields. And it's a really great pleasure having the four of you here and that you accepted our invitation of this webinar. Before we start, um, I'd like to give the word to my co-moderator, to Dr. Paula Andrea Diaz Valencia, to give a couple of words about Refreca. Muy buenos días para todos. Es un gusto enorme compartir con ustedes este espacio académico y contarles que hacemos parte de un proyecto especial llamado Repositorio para la vigilancia de las enfermedades crónicas en las Américas. Es un gusto de verdad compartir. Es, hacemos parte eh, de una serie de webinars que hemos estado promoviendo para que dentro de todo el espacio eh, que tengamos en este momento de compartir eh, información acerca de los indicadores de vigilancia epidemiológica para las Américas realmente lo podamos hacer y todos ustedes están bienvenidos a crecer con nosotros, a aportar soluciones. Este es el primero de varios webinars, eh, tuvimos el siguiente el año pasado, el primero de ellos el año pasado, eh, así que están todos bienvenidos. Eh, nuestro gran objetivo es desarrollar un sistema de monitoreo para la vigilancia epidemiológica de los diferentes factores de riesgo que afectan a las personas con enfermedades crónicas y queremos que sea un proceso de monitoreo y vigilancia que integre las Américas, que integre nuestras mayores necesidades y nuestros principales retos. Así que un grupo de expertos a lo largo de distintos países de las Américas está participando con una serie 
de instituciones que se han comprometido y que venimos apoyando de una manera decidida todo este trabajo. Ustedes pueden ver en pantalla muchísimos docentes de distintas universidades, eh, de distintos lugares del mundo y del cual hacemos eh, parte de una manera muy orgullosa y nos encanta que haya una cantidad de jóvenes también talentosos que están aquí aprendiendo, desarrollando y que próximamente eh, esperamos compartir con ustedes un gran repositorio de vigilancia. Entonces, muchísimas gracias y eh, vamos entonces a dar paso a nuestros panelistas. Gracias, profesor Novela. Muchas gracias, Paula. Thank you very much, Paula, for this brief presentation of, of one of the projects we have in Omnet. And with no fear ado, let's start a webinar with our first speaker. I'm welcoming Dr. Catherine Orgutsova, who did her statistical training in Moscow, Russia. Her postgraduate experience included demographic methods, public health medicine, a studentship at the Max Planck Institute of Demographic Research in Germany, and a PhD at the Groningen University, the Netherlands. Later, Catherine worked in the International Diabetes Federation as a data analyst and was responsible for estimating the worldwide burden of diabetes. She currently works in the German Diabetes Center in Düsseldorf in Germany, and her main research interests are health economic models of diabetes and its complications. Catherine also supports statistical analysis and scientific writing, as well as teaches our programming and statistical method. Catherine, it's a great pleasure having you here. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Thank you very much for so kind uh, introduction. I'm really proud being here today with such excellent speakers in one seminar. Uh, right now, I'll try to share my screen. Um, okay, uh, do you see the presentation? Yes. Yeah, great. Uh, so today I will talk about the challenge of undiagnosed diabetes in the population. And the first thing that I would like to note, it's um, during my presentation, I will talk about diabetes as a general term, but in most cases, it refers to type two diabetes. While it's possible to be, uh, to have undiagnosed type one diabetes, this is usually short in duration and due to rapid one set of complications and would not likely be measured in the population-based studies. That's why um, we talk about mostly type two diabetes. Some, uh, sorry, some background, some basic information. Type two diabetes, uh, it's a chron chronic disease. It takes a long time to develop and reach its diagnostic threshold. And we know that even for people with intermediate hypoglycemia, so below the threshold of diabetes, there is a higher risk of micro, microvascular complications. And a person with type 2 diabetes may only be diagnosed after the one set of micro or macrovascular complications like a retinopathy, nephropathy, neuropathy, or a stroke or coronary heart disease. Um, when we talk about undiagnosed diabetes, we um, mean a purely epidemiological term because it's very, it's impossible to define undiagnosed diabetes in clinical practice. So in epidemiology, undiagnosed diabetes, it's a proportion of patients who were not, no, uh, who were unaware of their diabetes. Uh, for decades, there is a standard practice using data from population-based uh, studies that include definition of diabetes uh, using both questionnaires, so it's self-reported diabetes and laboratory tests, and respondents who report a prior diabetes diagnosis or taking hypoglycemic drugs or taking insulin are classified as having diagnosed diabetes. And uh, those who do not report a dia diagnosis of diabetes, but test positive for diabetes, are classified as having undiagnosed diabetes. You can uh, hear, see the diagram here. 
And usually we report undiagnosed diabetes as a proportion. So it's a, um, a number of people with undiagnosed diabetes divided on a total diabetes cases or as a prevalence in a total population. And it's important to remember that undiagnosed diabetes, it's a proxy for a lack of diabetes awareness. But usually we don't use this term diabetes awareness or, or unawareness. Um, you can see in the publications such terms as a suspected diabetes or unknown diabetes or a new diabetes. In 2019, uh, the International Diabetes Federation estimated uh, that 463 million people in the world live with diabetes. And almost every second person with diabetes is unaware about it, so undiagnosed. Uh, it means that 232 million people in the world living with undiagnosed diabetes. If we look at the distribution of undiagnosed diabetes per region, Regions and right now I'm talking about adults, so people uh, older than 20 years, 20, 79 years old. We can see that, for example, in Europe or North America, it's the uh, last two lines. The, the proportion of undiagnosed diabetes is quite low. It's, it's uh, not so low, uh, less than 40%, but still in Africa, it's around 70% of people with diabetes are undiagnosed and all other regions are some, somehow in between. But most strikingly, uh, the contrast between low income countries and high income countries in high income countries, it's uh, less than 40% of people with diabetes are undiagnosed. While in low income countries, uh, three quarters of people with diabetes are not aware about the disease. But if we look at their absolute numbers, a number of people with the un undiagnosed diabetes on the right side in the table, we can see that majority of people living in the middle income countries. So the burden of diabetes lies there. Um, the problem with estimation of, of the IDF is that we don't have enough, enough reliable and comparable data available in the world. All gray countries here uh, didn't have data on undiagnosed diabetes on a population level. And if we look at Africa, it seems that we know nothing about Africa region because almost no, only several countries uh, have data on undiagnosed diabetes there. Um, when we talk about undiagnosed diabetes proportion as a one number for the whole country, we miss uh, a lot of details and heterogeneity within a population. Um, there is not so much evidence on factors uh, that influence the undiagnosis or diagnosis of diabetes. Uh, but what we know that the proportion of patients, for example, who are aware of their diabetes and treated for it was higher in all the population, in women and urban residents. We know that diabetes awareness slightly increased with educational attainment, um, with access to health care and uh, health literacy. Uh, on the other hand, limited access to health care, especially being uninsured or going without insurance for a long time, was significantly associated with being missed patient with diabetes. Uh, this study was done in the US and uh, the poor rates of diagnosis are largely um, a result of insufficient access to healthcare and poor healthcare systems. So key, key word here is access to healthcare. Um, on a country level, a heterogeneity is a result of combination of number fact of factors, including, for example, genetic variations, social and economic conditions in the country, performing or underperforming health system, health system, and of course, awareness among the general public, uh, healthcare professionals and policy makers. It's hard to compare country to country since we have so many layers of uh, complexity and I'm not aware about such a big study that compare countries. Uh, um, however, it's important 
to consider biases and degree of uncertainty when using estimates of undiagnosed diabetes to influence, for example, public health policy. There is several challenges in estimation of um, undiagnosed diabetes. The first, uh, the most important one is the fact that prevalence of diabetes depends on the type of test used to determine diabetes status. In a very big uh, pooled analysis of um, 96 population-based studies, done by NCD risk factor collaboration. NCD, it's a non-communicable diseases risk factor collaboration. It's a, a network of health scientists around the world. It was found that different definitions identified different people without a previous diagnosis as having diabetes, especially use of HbA1c based definition would not identify almost half of undiagnosed cases that could be detected with a fasting plasma glucose test, or more than three quarters of undiagnosed cases that would be detected by a, a fasting plasma glucose or OGTT test combined. And on the other hand, if we use only glucose-based test alone, we would not identify some people who would be considered as, as having diabetes um, with HbA1c test. Here you can see the, um, the plot from this publication. Um, and on the vertical line, uh, we have a prevalence of diabetes based on HbA1c test. And uh, horizontal lines, it's on the left side, diabetes prevalence based on uh, fasting plasma glucose. And on the right side, diabetes prevalence based on plasma, uh, fasting plasma glucose O or OGTT. And in, in the ideal world, we would expect having all dots on the line in the middle of the diagonal line, but we see the variation and all dots that above this diagonal line are a kind of overestimation of prevalence by HbA1c and uh, all dots below the line, it's underestimation of prevalence by HbA1c. And if we look at the right side, plot on the right side, we can say that, okay, the majority of cases, in majority of cases, the HbA1c underestimates uh, the prevalence of diabetes in the population if we assume that FBG and OGTT is a cold standard. But for some countries, for some uh, studies, uh, majority of them in South Asia, HbA1c showed a higher prevalence than um, than uh, glucose-based tests. When we use one or another criterion to define diabetes, we have to ask the crucial questions. Uh, the, whether subjects with unfavorable risk profiles are missed by criterion, whatever subject identified with diabetes by different criteria show different metabolic risk profiles. And right now we actually can say, could say that yes, it's true, different uh, tests uh, identify different uh, people with, um, with uh, uh, different pathogenic lines of diabetes. And whatever these non-overlapping groups have different risk of complications. And this is very, very complex, complex question. So we don't have right now the answer on this question. Um, and other challenges in estimation of undiagnosed diabetes is the sensitivity and general validity of self-report in identifying diabe diagnosed diabetes. Uh, for example, in comprehensive literature review done in, two, in two, 2004, um, the sensitivity of self-reported diabetes in survey data ranged from 70 to 99 percent, with median 81 percent. It means that quite few cases, um, false negative cases, then person was diagnosed with diabetes, but didn't, uh, didn't recall it or didn't report it. Uh, on the other hand, specific, uh, specificity was less variable and consistently high. It means that if person didn't have diabetes, it's uh, usually he or she didn't claim it. Uh, another challenge is within person variability in glycemic measurement. It can be high. That's why in clinical practice, uh, there is a recommendation to, to make another second test 
and prove that it's positive. Um, in majority of population-based studies where we uh, count undiagnosed cases, we use only one test and never checked if this, uh, if these diabetes tests uh, can be proved in a clinical format. So if we have a second positive test, that's why uh, probably some estimation of under, uh, uh, undiagnosed diabetes are um, higher than we would expect it. Uh, last but not least, uh, changes in laboratory measurements should be comparable and should be maintained over time if we want to see the, um, if, we, if we want to compare different time slots for the country or see the dynamic in the country with undiagnosed diabetes. Um, key messages from my talk uh, is follow, are following. Uh, first of all, failure to diagnose type two diabetes prevents patients from receiving effective treatments and may have serious consequences. In many countries, uh, there is a lack of dat dat data on undiagnosed diabetes prevalence at the population level. Proportion of undiagnosed diabetes varies within population depending on socioeconomic factors, geographical area, access to an appropriate health care, and general awareness of diabetes. And proportion of undiagnosed diabetes depend on the type of test used to determine type 2 diabetes status. Uh, this is my last slide, and it shows the, the projection uh, of global prevalence of diabetes for the next decades. And it just reminds us that we are living not only during the pandemic of COVID, but during the pandemic of um, diabetes. And the number of people with diabetes will rise next year, as well as number of people with undiagnosed diabetes. And we have to do something <laughs> with it. Uh, right now. Thank you very much for your attention. Muchísimas gracias, doctora Catherine. Ha sido un gusto enorme escucharla. Bueno, yo voy a tener en este momento el inmenso placer de presentar al profesor Jacob Tunileto. Yo creo que este es un momento histórico para mí, profesor Jacob, porque Eh, cuando hice mi doctorado leí todos sus papers, todos sus artículos y realmente este re, es un momento feliz para mí poderlo presentar. Bueno, entonces, para nuestro querido auditorio, el profesor Jacob Tumileto es profesor emérito del Instituto de Salud Pública en Finlandia, la Universidad de Helsinki. Ha coordinado numerosos investigaciones y proyectos científicos y ha contribuido de una manera muy, muy especial a entender el proyecto de Carelia del Norte en Finlandia, así como muchos otros proyectos. Ha um, hecho también el primer estudio de prevención basado en comunidad para programas de, de enfermedades cardiocerebrovasculares, empezando en 1970, así que es pionero en este campo. También ha iniciado, fue el iniciador, el promotor del de estudio de prevención para la diabetes en Finlandia y logró demostrar que fue posible una reducción del 58% de la incidencia de diabetes tipo 2 solo con modificaciones del estilo de vida. Yo creo que eso es algo memorable que debemos todos aprender, los que amamos este campo y los que queremos seguir avanzando. Es una esperanza sobre todo. Ha desarrollado también una, eh, digamos, un estudio, un score magnífico que es el Thin Risk. Es un estudio que permite de manera eh, no, sin requerir laboratorio, evaluar el riesgo de diabetes tipo 2. Y este instrumento ha sido validado en Europa y en otros países eh, fuera del contexto europeo. Además ha sido investigador principal de un maravilloso estudio que le digo, leí todos los papers, es el Diamond Project, eh, que mapeó la incidencia de diabetes tipo 1 en el mundo entero en la década de los 90, en más de 100 países del mundo. Ha recibido numerosos premios, numerosos Eh, reconocimientos, eh, es profesor en muchísimas universidades del sistema de posgraduación o de educación superior 
y ha entrenado a muchísimas personas en el mundo sobre diabetes y prevención cardiovascular. Ha contribuido en más de 1,700 papers y publicaciones científicas y bueno, es yo creo que una de las personas más citadas alrededor del mundo. Así que profesor, es un honor enorme, inmenso que esté con nosotros y lo escuchamos con toda atención y cariño. Gracias. Yeah. Well. Hmm. Sorry, I have to close the other things. <sighs> I try to share my screen, but uh, ah, here we go. Yeah, it's a green bottle. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I had too many things open otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> Thank I'm you. sorry about it. I'm sorry about the, my poor start. Um, okay, here we go. <clears throat> Thank you very much for a very nice introduction and greetings uh, from Finland. It, it is. Um, a great pleasure to be part of, uh, of this uh, meeting. Um, Finland is a country with a few um, special features. Uh, one, one of them is that um, we have the highest incidence of type 1 diabetes in the world, in childhood and in, in general. And uh, also that uh, this is the first country where we started uh, the nationwide diabetes prevention activity uh, about 20 years ago already. Now, what I'm presenting pretty much is um, the data that has been gathered in the uh, Diabetes in Finland database, uh, uh, which um, uh, you can identify at the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare uh, website. Uh, and this is uh, based on, on the data sets um, that uh, in, in Finland we uh, have been gathering from the entire population nationwide. Birth, death, uh, hospital discharges, outpatient uh, prescription register, every prescription in the pharmacy is registered and reimbursement of, uh, of uh, medicine cost, cancer register, kidney register, cause of death, and so on and so on. Uh, even we have a lot of data on socioeconomic uh, information in the data uh, database. And you can see here uh, the, and the different uh, ways uh, how they are coded because um, uh, in, in some of the uh, uh, registries like the hospital recharge and, and the causes of death, uh, the classification has been changing over time. I'm not going into detail, but I just mentioned that there are a lot of different registries and, and standardized uh, information. And, and these uh, uh, cover uh, the uh, demographics, medications, health services, comorbidities, sickness allowances, pensions, uh, premature pensions, and uh, socioeconomic data, including education earnings and so on. Now, what we have been seeing in Finland, uh, in 1965, we received for the first time 
uh, the national ID number. And using the national ID number, uh, the uh, new cases of type 2 and type 1 diabetes were identified uh, through uh, the register, which was uh, uh, for the reimbursement of uh, cost of uh, uh, medication. Now, the first years um, uh, were obviously a little bit uh, lousy, but since 1970, uh, we have a full proper data. And you can see here that uh, the type 1 diabetes is not changing that much uh, in the scale that you will see here. On the other hand, this is uh, really uh, uh, lying with the statistics to, to show uh, uh, the, the curve like that. Type 2 diabetes, depending on a certain uh, factors uh, with the reimbursement of the drug cost and also the diagnostic criteria like A1C introduction uh, has influenced uh, uh, the number of new cases. But these are numbers of cases. Uh, we have to look at the prevalence, how many individuals per population there are. And here we will see that the prevalence uh, of type 2 diabetes has been dramatically increasing uh, from uh, uh, less than 100,000 now, uh, uh, more than 400,000 individuals treated for type 2 diabetes. And also type 1 diabetes prevalence is increasing. More important is to understand uh, the incidence, the new cases uh, per population. And the, here is about 10,000 individuals uh, during the <clears throat> period of time from 2000 to 2018. And you will see how the, uh, the uh, uh, incidence of type 2 diabetes went up until 2009, and then gradually is coming down. Now we don't know at the moment whether it is true or whether it's a diagnostic uh, uh, um, bias because A1C was introduced 2009 globally, but not in Finland, but still it's used. Uh, the incidence of type 1 diabetes looks uh, uh, like, like um, um, stable. Uh, the prevalence of type 2 and type 1 diabetes, you can see here, especially type 2 diabetes is increasing all the time. Finland uh, is a small country uh, when it comes to the population, but it's a large country when it comes to geography. Uh, it's uh, one of the biggest countries in Europe. And uh, there are certain differences in, uh, in different areas uh, in terms of type 1 and type 2 diabetes incidence. Uh, uh, here you see that uh, the, uh, in the dark blue, uh, there is a high incidence and in the, in the dark green, there is a low incidence. And there is no clear geographic pattern uh, for type 1 diabetes. On the other hand, for type 2 diabetes, it seems that the eastern part of Finland has a little bit higher uh, incidence than, than uh, in the western part of the country. Now, when the type 1 diabetes uh, uh, is evaluated for the incidence in childhood onset diabetes, which is in most of the cases, not all, but most of the cases under the age of 15, the onset, you can see that until uh, about 2008, there was an increasing trend and has been ever since uh, before. But after that, there was a a decrease and then leveling off. Now the question is how this type 1 diabetes which does have a diagnostic bias because everybody uh, needs treatment with insulin, uh, how we can interpret uh, these data. Is it so that for the first time we will see the decrease in type 1 diabetes incidence. Let's go to the publication 
um, less than 10 years ago, where uh, the trends were evaluated in a three different uh, uh, time periods in the early 80s to uh, late 80s, during the 90s until 2000 and so on, and then the period when the decrease started to appear. Now we have to understand that the period here, which looks like a decrease in incidence, it happened in the same way in the 1980s, but then it was followed by a steady increase. So a couple of years uh, to have a lower incidence really doesn't prove the point that there is a true decrease. And if we draw the regression line over all the years, there is no, nothing else but a steady increase in type 1 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes, however, as I pointed out, may have a diagnostic bias. And in Finland, have a clearly, the, uh, clearly higher uh, type 2 diabetes incidence compared with women, and so is the prevalence. And in both sexes, there seem to be exactly similar trends. Uh, peak here in 2008, then decrease, uh, and, and the nadir in 2010, and then going up to 2011. Now, how come, how come that both in men and women, the curves are identical? To me, it tells that there is some bias in the, in the diagnostic uh, procedures or criteria or something. Otherwise, these peaks and narries cannot happen exactly at the same time in both sexes. Now, uh, one thing, of course, is important for type 2 diabetes, obesity. Uh, here, for men, we have a surveys every five years, about five to 10,000 individuals, uh, a random sample in different areas of the country, eastern part, southwest, and, and the capital Helsinki and north Oulu. And you can see everywhere in men, the body mass index is increasing. So, well, it may be that this is a reason uh, for that. But on the other hand, in women, there is no increase in body mass index in the middle aged population. I turn to the um, complications here. Uh, these uh, rich databases we have in Finland allows us to look at uh, many different aspects uh, of a complication. Uh, starting from mortality, comparing a mortality in a general population in Finland, that is a standardized mortality uh, uh, ratio. And you can see how much more cancer mortality is type one diabetes, type two, cardiovascular, coronary heart disease, stroke, especially alcohol related is uh, common in type one diabetes in Finland. And so the accidents uh, and violence, uh, which sometimes are, can be counted for hypoglycemia. So, but anywhere, there's a threefold increase in mortality in type 1 diabetes in male and, and uh, 1.65 in, in type 2 diabetes. In women, uh, in type 1 diabetes, you can see that numbers are huge. Coronary heart disease, eightfold from the background population, uh, alcohol related, threefold, altogether fourfold increase in type 1 diabetes in women compared with the background population. For type 2, it's very similar to, to that in men. And, and it's well known that when women have diabetes, they have similar, at least similar mortality. Uh, than, than uh, men. And usually in the background population, uh, women have a lower mortality than men. Now, uh, looking at the uh, mortality in a cohort of individuals aged uh, 30 to 79 years, 
three different periods here in the early 90s, late 90s, early 2000. That is a starting point of, of the cohort. And you can see here that there is altogether uh, almost 20% decrease in mortality between period one and two, and also similar between period two and three. Uh, and this is very much related to coronary heart disease mortality, which has uh, decreased more than 20%, uh, especially uh, the good <clears throat> Uh, results are in non-manual workers, uh, that's a higher educated individuals, but also so-called manual workers uh, have experienced 20% decrease in coronary heart uh, disease mortality when they have diabetes. Now in coronary heart disease mortality, especially in type 1 diabetes, but also in type 2 diabetes, uh, depends on the duration of diabetes. In Finland, where we have a huge number of uh, cases, uh, childhood onset cases, we can see that uh, uh, men and women have a very similar rates and up to 35 years of, uh, of diabetes duration, uh, uh, the cumulative incidence of coronary heart disease is somewhere between eight and 9%. And that is uh, duration of diabetes 35 years, these people are about 50 or less than 50 at that point in time, because it's a childhood onset diabetes. So very, very high coronary heart disease incidence in childhood onset type one diabetes. Coronary heart disease and cardiovascular disease in, in general is a major issue in diabetes. Most of the people with diabetes die from coronary heart disease or stroke. And here are the data for the first CVD event, okay, combining non-fatal and fatal events. Clearly you can see both men and women, the numbers are going down and rates are going down. However, when calculated so-called population attributable fraction due to diabetes in men, it's going up. So the diabetic men have a higher relative uh, uh, rate of a cardiovascular event compared uh, with uh, non-diabetic population. In women, however, trend is opposite. They are doing better. And uh, why is that? Socioeconomic factors, smoking, and so on. Uh, we only can speculate at this point. And then a couple of words about cancer. Uh, cancer register has existed in Finland since the 1950s already, and we have uh, uh, analyzed the data uh, since 1988 for diabetes, and we could see that standardized incidence ratio on new cases of cancer was 18% increase in people with diabetes compared with the Finnish background population. And here you see the standardized incidence ratio different uh, cancers. And what you can observe here that basically all of them, pharynx not, but all of them are over one. That means that there is an increase. Again, go further, uh, chest, lung cancer not, but the all others again uh, over one. The only single cancer which has a significantly decreased incidence is a prostate cancer. And that has been confirmed by other studies as well. So cancers, over 20 different cancer sites are increased in diabetic individuals. We cannot tease out that there is a single cancer which is the most important. Basically all cancers except prostate uh, uh, is increased uh, in diabetic individuals. Another complication is the amputations. And here is a, a data by socioeconomic status. Uh, lowest socioeconomic status has the highest uh, amputation rate. And in, in the early 1990s, uh, over 600 uh, per 10,000 individuals, where as in the highest, there was 2,000. In both, low and high socioeconomic groups, there has been a decrease. 
but in the absolute numbers from 600 to about 250, it's a dramatic decrease in the lowest socioeconomic group from uh, uh, the highest socioeconomic group 200 and now it's somewhere like 50. Uh, still the relative uh, difference exists but uh, absolute numbers have really uh, been best in the lowest socioeconomic group. Another aspect is uh, uh, retinopathy or visual impairment and we did a long-term data analysis uh, covering uh, uh, from 1982 to 2010. And we could show that uh, people who had uh, uh, proliferatory uh, diabetic retinopathy, uh, the, the proportion of individuals uh, decreased dramatically over the years. And the total number also went down very, very significantly. So it seems that the retinopathy really has uh, gone down in the Finnish population. And then the word about the kidney disease, renal di replacement, um, uh, resistor, type 2 diabetes. Uh, yeah, you can see Finnish, but uh, you can understand type 2 diabetes in blue went up till, uh, till the year 2000 and now coming down gradually. Type 1 diabetes uh, has gone up also by 2000, went down, but now again coming, coming higher. So diabetes is a major cause of the renal replacement therapy. And then survival probability in type 1 diabetes is better than in two, type 2 diabetes uh, in a national kidney register. So there is a different uh, but survival seem to be improving. Now, finally, conclusions. We have uh, several data sources uh, that can be applied in surveillance of diabetes uh, based on the registered data. So we don't have to contact the uh, uh, people themselves. We can, we can look at the registered data, which are uh, really reliable because uh, we have a national ID number and we can trace every individual through this uh, ID number. Uh, time trends are difficult because there are different sort of biases, several biases and changes in diagnostic criteria, not for, for other diseases. And surveillance of unrecognized, undiagnosed diabetes and pre-diabetes can only be monitored by risk factor surveys. There is no other way to do that. And in Finland, we are doing it every five years, but uh, glucose tolerance tests have, has only been uh, used occasionally every now and then in these surveys. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jaco. Very, very nice call. Thank you very much. I will switch to Spanish. Um, para las personas que nos están hablando, escuchando, recuerden el botón interpretación, podemos cambiar de lenguaje entre inglés, español o español inglés, eh, el de su preferencia. Muchísimas gracias, doctor Jacob Tumileto, excelente eh, conferencia, de verdad inspiradora y sobre todo saber que hay posibilidad de modificar, es algo que deberíamos eh, empezar a aprender todos y a rescatar todo ese valor. Vamos ahorita al final de preguntas y respuestas a mirar qué retos tenemos. Eh, así como un diamond, un euro diab, nos falta un latin diab algún día. <ríe> bueno, entonces vamos a dar en este momento paso al doctor Pablo Asner, también es un honor enorme tener con nosotros al doctor Pablo Asner en este grupo de conferencistas. El doctor Pablo Asner es nuestro, nuestra cuota colombiana. Muchísimas gracias, profesor, por estar con nosotros. Les cuento que el profesor es, es profesor asociado a la Escuela Javeriana, a la Universidad Javeriana, la Escuela de Endocrinología y la Facultad de Medicina de esta importante institución en Colombia. Ha sido el director de la, del Hospital Internacional, del Hospital de San Diego, eh, de la Universidad de San Ignacio, perdón. Ha sido el director científico de la Asociación Colombiana de Diabetes. 
se graduó en medicina eh, de la Universidad Javeriana y de ahí eh, avanzó en su posgrado en endocrinología en el Hospital Militar y los terminó y terminó toda su formación en la Universidad de Cambridge en el Reino Unido. Allí se graduó como endocrinólogo y desde entonces viene trabajando en el campo. También realizó una maestría en epidemiología clínica. Ha sido realmente uno de nuestros investigadores colombianos más importantes en la materia. Ha incluido dentro de sus investigaciones asuntos que tienen que ver con el diagnóstico, el control y el tratamiento de la diabetes, así como la epidemiología de la diabetes y sus complicaciones. Ha trabajado muchísimo también en síndrome metabólico para América Latina y el rol de, las, eh, atenci de la atención primaria en las, en las diversas asociaciones que, que tenemos y las diversas asociaciones de diabetes. Ha sido autor y coautor de más de 90 artículos científicos, libros, capítulos de libros en el campo de la diabetes y es miembro de numerosas asociaciones que incluyen la Asociación Latinoamericana de Diabetes y la Asociación Panamericana de Endocrinología. También ha sido experto y conferencista invitado en la eh, Organización Mundial de la Salud, panelista en diferentes actividades que tienen que ver con diabetes, enfermedades crónicas y los diferentes grupos de investigación y es el actual presidente de la Sociedad Colombiana de Endocrinología de la Asociación Latinoamericana de Diabetes y del Grupo de Epidemiología de Diabetes para Latinoamérica. Y actualmente además es líder del grupo que estudia el síndrome metabólico eh, y, y tiene todo, um, digamos, y todo, todo el trabajo que está también haciendo en el ADF, en la Federación Internacional de la Diabetes. Y profesor Pablo Ashner, es un gusto grandísimo para nosotros tenerlo con, en este grupo de panelistas y le damos la bienvenida. Adelante con su conferencia, profesor. Uh, muchas gracias por la, la introducción. Eh, me endilgaste algunas presidencias que no tengo, pero <ríe> eh, eh, muchas gracias de nuevo. Eh, voy a compartir aquí pantalla. Ok. Bien, eh, mi, lo que voy a tratar de, de presentar en este corto tiempo es um, el tema de la vigilancia de la diabetes en Sudamérica, pero sobre todo voy a hacer énfasis en qué se puede hacer en países de ingreso bajo o medio. Ya ustedes le oyeron a Jaco qué se puede hacer en países de ingreso alto y sobre todo con una organización óptima en términos de vigilancia en salud. Eh, la vigilancia de la diabetes en Sudamérica probablemente comenzó con esta reunión de la Declaración de las Américas en el 96, donde entre los objetivos de la Declaración de las Américas, que lleva por nombre DOTA, por cierto ya no está activa, eh, estaba el promover encuestas eh, sobre diabetes, promover el estudio de tendencias de factores de riesgo, facilitar el, el estudio de las complicaciones eh, y contribuir al mejoramiento de estadísticas de mortalidad en diabetes. Eh, y las metas eran eh, pues hacer una revisión de la información que se tenía en epidemiología, eh, controlar las actividades de sondeo, que es la palabra que se usó en vez de vigilancia, sobre diabetes, factores de riesgo y estimular el análisis de estadísticas de mortalidad. Con esta um, carta de intención, digámoslo así, eh, de esta reunión de la Declaración de las Américas, el doctor Gallardino en La Plata, Argentina, comenzó eh, a organizar esto que se llamó la red Qualidiab, que consistía básicamente en hacer... Eh, en distribuir un cuestionario sobre el estado de las personas con diabetes a lo largo de Latinoamérica. El, um, se comenzó con un programa piloto de control de calidad eh, parecido al Diabcare europeo, eh, básicamente tratando de promover el desarrollo de una red entre varios centros de diferentes países 
para demostrar la utilidad de usar un registro común y compartir la información y su análisis. Eh, comenzó en el 99, a finales del siglo pasado, con un seminario de entrenamiento para voluntarios de los países que querían participar. Y esto es más o menos como se organizó eh, los países que queríamos participar, mandábamos la información a La Plata, ahí la procesaban y nos devolvían eh, información sobre en qué lugar estábamos eh, en, el, en, digamos, en la distribución de los diferentes parámetros de control de, 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 de la atención, pues de la diabetes. Y esto estaba supervisado por un centro de enlace en, en Francia, de Eurolat. Las fortalezas de, esta, de este eh, proyecto es el tener un registro unificado de diabetes por primera vez, explorando calidad de atención y complicaciones. Eh, pero las debilidades, pues es que eh, se trata de cortes transversales, digamos que se mandan registros de pacientes por una única vez en general. La mayoría de los pacientes son atendidos en centros especializados, o sea que quizás lo que podíamos ver era el mejor escenario y la inclusión no aleatoria, o sea, los médicos voluntarios incluían los pacientes que quisieran, eh, podría ser, por ejemplo, aquellos que tuvieran los datos completos. Este es el cuestionario actual que se está utilizando, donde, como ven, se exploran eh, aspectos de diagnóstico y clínica, eh, aspectos que tienen que ver con parámetros de laboratorio, con educación, tabaquismo, complicaciones agudas y hospitalizaciones y aquellos con tratamiento. Eh, el problema es que pues esto el médico voluntario tiene que extraerlo de la historia y pasarlo al registro. Eh, no hay una forma fácil de lograr que esto sea la historia clínica del paciente, obviamente. Eh, este fue la primera publicación que se hizo de más de 13.000 registros de diferentes países, incluyendo el mío, Colombia, de nuestro centro. Ahí ven ustedes las características de los pacientes tipo 1 y tipo 2, pues que en términos generales eran de evolución más bien corta, eh, eh, duración de menos de de cinco años hasta cinco años de más o menos la mitad de los sujetos, sobre todo diabetes tipo 2. Y pues lo que era de esperar, obviamente los tipo 2 tienen un mayor índice de masa corporal al punto de que un, casi una tercera parte tenía un índice de masa corporal por encima de 30 en esa época. Esto fue publicado en el 2001. Y quizás lo que más llama la atención es que eh, al evaluar los... Eh, eh, alcance del, de la hemoglobina glicosilada, tanto en tipo 2 como tipo 1, vemos que es muy pobre. En, en eh, verde claro y un poco más oscuro está la hemoglobina hasta 8, que en ese momento se consideraba un nivel por lo menos adecuado o aceptable. Y miren que apenas el 25% de los pacientes reportados tenían esa hemoglobina. O sea que aunque viene, esta información proviene de centros, entre comillas, especializados, y si este es el mejor escenario, pues nos podemos imaginar cuál sería el de centros no especializados, centros de atención primaria. Eh, también llama la atención la cantidad de sujetos que no tienen dato de hemoglobina glicosilada, casi un 40% o más de un 40% en diabetes tipo 2, y un 30% en diabetes tipo 1. Y con relación a la frecuencia de complicaciones al ser reportadas, pues lo que muestran es, eh, en términos de un aumento de la retinopatía eh, en la medida en que hay una madura, mayor duración de la enfermedad, que eso lo sabemos, y lo mismo con neuropatía, pero en cuanto a enfermedad cardiovascular, probablemente vemos un marcado subregistro Probablemente porque los pacientes que desarrollan enfermedad cardiovascular ya no van a los centros de diabetes, sino van más bien a centros donde haya servicio de, eh, cardiovascular. Y las amputaciones también aparentemente son bajas. Este es otro informe ya 10 eh, años después, eh, donde vemos 
eh, de tres centros especializados, incluyendo nuevamente el de la Asociación Colombiana de Diabetes, el nuestro en Colombia, eh, de un poco más de mil eh, pacientes, estos son solo tipo 2. Ahí ven ustedes las características de los, de los pacientes. La mayoría tienen una duración de alrededor de 10 años y el promedio de hemoglobina glicosilada aquí pues estaba un poco mejor de 7.8 más menos 2%. Eh, y aquí ven ustedes las diferentes frecuencias de complicaciones eh, están bastante, eh, 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 digamos, desglosadas, eh, pero en términos generales, si lo comparamos con la del 2001, pues en retinopatía y neuropatía no es tanta la diferencia. En nefropatía claramente sí, o, o lo cual indica que está mejorando la detección de la eh, nefropatía. Eh, en, en ceguera ha aumentado casi cuatro veces y miren ustedes, infarto agudo del miocardio, eh, inclusive si sumamos todas las enfermedades cardiovasculares, claramente vemos que aumenta en este nuevo reporte, lo cual está indicando no tanto que haya aumentado realmente, sino que había un marcado subregistro y lo mismo pasa con amputaciones. Y desafortunadamente esto puede ocurrir porque como les expliqué, básicamente eh, no, hay una, no, no hay una forma sistemática de escoger los pacientes que se van a reportar. Bien, eh, pero esta es una forma de hacerlo a través de una red de, de, de centros que quieran contribuir con estos cuestionarios. Eh, otra forma de hacerlo es esta, el estudio IDMPS. Es un estudio de cortes transversales sucesivos que llamamos olas o waves en países de ingreso bajo medio. Esto no está limitado a Latinoamérica, pero hay un importante aporte de Latinoamérica. Y lo que consiste es en que los médicos seleccionados aleatoriamente recolecten los datos de las personas con diabetes que atienden en un periodo definido de tiempo. El objetivo pues es también valorar lo mismo. Este es un, este es un proyecto patrocinado por Sanofi, aunque el comité, el Steering Committee es muy independiente, somos, realmente podemos actuar de una manera muy independiente, pero hay interés especial en ver cómo se maneja la insulina en las diferentes regiones y los objetivos específicos varían dependiendo de la ola de que se trate. La fortaleza es que nuevamente es un registro unificado. Aquí sí hay selección aleatoria de los médicos y un reclutamiento sistemático. Los primeros 10 con tipo 2 y 5 con tipo 1 que lleguen a la consulta del médico durante una ventana de dos semanas. Pero sigue siendo eh, un, un, el tema de cortes transversales eh, que aunque están hechos a lo largo del tiempo, pues no constituyen una cohorte. Hasta el momento se han hecho ocho olas, la última eh, se terminó el año pasado. Eh, y ahí ven ustedes la participación de Latinoamérica, que en algunos casos ha sido considerable hasta 61% del, de los sujetos ingresados. En otras olas, como la 6 y la 7, no estuvo presente Latinoamérica. Y este es el dato de la primera ola, eh, en, eh, que se publicó en el 2009, donde vemos comparativamente lo que ocurre en Asia, Europa y Latinoamérica, Europa del Este. Eh, no son muy diferentes las, los, los promedios, excepto quizás el índice de masa corporal más bajo en Asia. La duración quizás eh, un poco más larga en Latinoamérica, la duración de la diabetes. Eh, estos son tipo 1 y tipo 2, lo que estamos viendo ahí. Y los promedios de hemoglobina glicosilada son igual de malos en, en las diferentes regiones. No hay mucha diferencia. Y aquí vemos la proporción de pacientes que no han, eh, en quienes no se ha evaluado, por ejemplo, la hemoglobina glicosilada. Y en Latinoamérica sigue siendo importante, aunque no tanto como lo veíamos en, en el estudio que les mostré anteriormente, pero hasta un 24% de las personas con diabetes nunca se han hecho una hemoglobina glicosilada y el 19% de las personas con diabetes tipo 1. Y microalbuminuria, 30 y algo por ciento de las personas con tipo 2 y 20% con tipo 1 no eh, se han hecho una microalbuminuria. 
Eh, y esto es, eh, muestra el alcance de metas, la triple meta de hemoglobina glicosilada, presión arterial y colesterol LL por debajo de 100. Y ven ustedes que pues, eh, las metas de presión arterial y colesterol se ven mejores en tipo 1 porque es gente más joven que probablemente sin medicación está en meta. Eh, pero la hemoglobina glicosilada es mejor en tipo 2 y no hay muchas diferencias entre las tres regiones, Asia, Europa del Este y Latinoamérica. Y este es un estudio que acabamos de publicar donde cogimos todas las primeras siete olas, eh, o sea, una, un, un lapso de tiempo de 12 años. Y aquí lo que estamos viendo es qué ha pasado con la hemoglobina glicosilada y tristemente no ha habido una mejoría a lo largo del tiempo en alcanzar el eh, una hemoglobina glicosilada por debajo de 7. Eh, es, es realmente lamentable y está mostrando inercia y esto es en, eh, en las tres regiones, incluyendo Latinoamérica eh, en, este, en este estudio. Eh, esto nos muestra el, la última ola, esto lo presenté a, recién a, en, el, en el Congreso de la EASD eh, del año pasado, en, el último, en la última ola analizamos eh, qué tanto estaba cumpliéndose la meta eh, dependiendo del tratamiento. Y lo que da la impresión, francamente, es que la, la, el uso de insulina lo que sirve es de marcador para peor control. Eh, debería ser al revés. El comienzo de insulina debería mejorar el control. No todos los médicos creen que la meta sea eh, por debajo de 7. Apenas un una, uno de cada cuatro piensa eso y los demás piensan que la meta debería ser un poco más alta, pero aún así menos de la mitad de los médicos eh, mostraron en sus pacientes alcance de la meta. Vemos entonces cómo se pueden obtener informaciones interesantes de eh, una, un estudio de corte transversal hecho sucesivamente en el tiempo, permite comparar y si es aleatoria la selección, por lo menos de los médicos, permite que la comparación esté con menos sesgos. Idealmente debería ser aleatorio para los pacientes y de base poblacional, pero por lo menos permite tener una radiografía de qué está ocurriendo eh, y en el caso nuestro de qué está ocurriendo en Latinoamérica. Ahora, la, la, la servicio de salud del país como fuente de información puede ser posible en países como el nuestro, que tiene una cobertura universal que en este momento llega a, a 97 y algo por ciento de la población, lo cual es óptimo. Eh, eso está dividido en régimen contributivo que constituye todas aquellas personas y sus familias que están laborando y que aportan al al servicio de salud, lo mismo que sus eh, empleadores, y el 50% al régimen subsidiado, que por no tener trabajo o tener trabajo informal, esas personas y sus familias pues eh, reciben la, la atención gratuita. Eh, ambos sistemas proporcionan cobertura universal con acceso a todo. Eh, la fortaleza de obtener información de esto pues es que la base es poblacional, las debilidades básicamente son los reportes incompletos y la difícil validación. Eh, dentro de eh, este sistema se han identificado enfermedades que se llaman de alto costo y es obligatorio reportar los pacientes que eh, clasifiquen como enfermedad de alto costo y ahí ven ustedes la enfermedad renal crónica y por ser la hipertensión y la diabetes factores de riesgo claves para enfermedad renal crónica, también hay que reportarlos. De hecho, este informe del 2019 muestra la proporción de personas de alrededor de 4.5 millones de sujetos que tenían diabetes o hipertensión o ambas eh, con o sin enfermedad renal. Ahí ven ustedes la distribución de las diferentes eh, patologías y eh, permite este tipo de, de información, en este caso incidencia que realmente no es incidencia eh, para diabetes tipo 2 porque es simplemente cuando se hizo el diagnóstico, pero no sabemos cuándo empezó la enfermedad. 
Eh, y como ven ustedes ahí, pues eh, la incidencia de, por mil habitantes es un poco mayor en mujeres que en hombres, pero como ven abajo, el punto es que el 80% de estos datos fueron reportados por el régimen contributivo y apenas el 19% por el régimen subsidiado, a pesar de que son mitad a mitad. Luego hay una marcada deficiencia en el reporte, aún considerando que es una norma, que es obligatorio. Y ese es el principal problema de estos datos que no, no son completos. Eh, algunas entidades de atención en salud y responsables de la, del manejo, las EPS, reportan mucho más que otras. Entonces eso hace que la incidencia eh, realmente, pues en este caso incidencia sea quizás no confiable y lo mismo pasa con la prevalencia, un poco mayor en mujeres que en hombres. Hay un poquito ese cambio en prevalencia que mencionaba el doctor Tomileto, pero que probablemente no es real o por lo menos una meseta, eh, probablemente tiene que ver con el aporte de datos. Y de nuevo, fíjense la diferencia entre lo reportado por el régimen contributivo y subsidiado, lo que da una prevalencia en el régimen contributivo de 3.7 global y en el otro de 2.1, o sea, depende mucho de la confiabilidad de los datos y qué tan completos son. Eh, de hecho, la prevalencia está subestimada. Para Colombia, en el Atlas de la IDF del 2019, la prevalencia es mucho más alta que esta que está eh, reportándose acá pro, eh, con la fuente de los datos del sistema de salud. La prevalencia es de 8.4% para, para nosotros. Eh, claro está que eh, esto está reportando la gente atendida, la gente diagnosticada, y el 39% de, de nuestra población está sin diagnóstico. Y este es otro, otro dato interesante que viene de la misma fuente y es el, el, qué, qué porcentaje de la, de la población atendida tiene estos parámetros, por ejemplo, control de hemoglobina glicosila, alrededor del 49%, no está mal para la gente que va a las entidades de salud, eso ha mejorado. Eh, ¿Qué porcentaje con meta de hemoglobina por grado 7? 46%, tampoco está mal. Y en fin, ahí ven todos los demás parámetros. Eh, en cuanto a meta de LDL menor de 100, probablemente hoy en día tiene más valor qué porcentaje de los pacientes están tomando estatina, teniendo en cuenta que casi el 100% de los tipo 2 deberían estar tomando estatina en dosis eh, bajas o, o altas, dependiendo de la patología adicional que tengan. Realmente lo ideal, y ya para terminar, es que pudiéramos montar un registro. Eh, un registro que, eh, como su nombre lo indica, permita registrar los datos de los pacientes de una manera sistemática, ojalá de base poblacional. Se pueden usar fuentes diversas para esto, eh, no solamente la historia clínica, pero que se pueda mantener, porque la clave de los registros es que haya un equipo eh, multidisciplinario que se acuerde un mínimo de datos que se puedan recabar una plataforma adecuada, asegurar suficientes recursos, esto es muy importante y obviamente eh, tener en cuenta los temas de confidencialidad y protección de datos. Para los que estén interesados en esto de los registros les recomiendo la guía que vamos a sacar el mes entrante para eh, estudios de Epidemiología de la Diabetes es una guía que incluye un capítulo sobre registros eh, eh, y que pues es interesante para quienes quieran comenzar a hacer registros. Eh, este es un ejemplo de un registro que hicimos con, un, eh, con la, el doctor Harris, Stuart Harris en, en Canadá, eh, usando la misma, el mismo registro, el GRAND, eh, y lo que queríamos era comparar cómo, eh, cómo está el estado de nuestros pacientes atendidos en la asociación de diabetes y los de Canadá y sobre todo en los recién diagnosticados ver qué tan frecuentes era, eran las diferentes complicaciones y lo que concluimos es que demuestra que nuestros pacientes en Colombia son diagnosticados más tarde que en Canadá y ya tienen una mayor frecuencia de complicaciones. Pero lo que quiero señalar es el problema que hay con los registros si no se tiene una buena financiación. 
Este registro estaba patrocinado por un laboratorio, lo conseguimos por, por casi tres años, pero finalmente se suspendió y el, el registro no obtuvo más financiación, se, se cerró y ya no pudimos continuar con esa plataforma. Esto es eh, clave, la financiación para los registros. No, tiene, no sirve de nada un registro de, de un año o dos años, deben mantenerse en el tiempo. Bien, entonces para ya concluir, ¿qué se puede hacer en países de ingreso bajo medio? Para diabetes tipo 2 probablemente los costes, cortes transversales, como le mostré con el Qualidiab y el IDMPS, ojalá de manera, recabando la información de manera sistemática, preferencia aleatoria y de base poblacional. El, eh, se mencionó el repositorio eh, que está eh, haciéndose en Latinoamérica, ojalá sea con datos confiables, completos y verificables. Para tipo 1, que no es tanta la población en Latinoamérica, somos menos que por lo que se ve en Europa y ciertamente en Finlandia, quizás ahí valdría la pena montar un registro, pero repito que se pueda mantener en el tiempo ya sea de los que requieren insulina o de toda la población menor de 20 años con diabetes. Eh, es, es factible, repito, porque nuestra población no es tan grande en tipo 1. Bien, yo creo que esto es suficiente. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, um, Pablo, for excellent presentation. It provides an overview about the surveillance of diabetes in South America. It's Always a great pleasure learning from your experience. Our last presentation of today is, it's really a great pleasure presenting you Edward Gregg. He has a PhD and he serves as professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the School of Public Health, Imperial College in London. He moved from the US to UK when the UK still was part of Europe. He joined the Imperial College in 2019, becoming a Royal Society of Boston Fellowship. So prior to coming to Imperial College, he led a multidisciplinary public health science unit in the division of diabetes translation at the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where he championed the role of epidemiology for public health decision-making through diverse disciplines that included population surveillance, effectiveness trials, natural experiments, and health impact modeling. He has interest in factors driving recent trends in the diabetes epidemics and the impact of life interventions and related health policy in diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and aging-related outcomes. Ed, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. It's really great pleasure that you connected to this late evening uh, UK time for our webinars. Go ahead. Thank you, Noel. Can you all can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Very good. Hey, um, it's very nice to. First of all, it's great to. Thanks for the kind introduction, Noel. It's really nice to see my close colleagues again and to be part of all this. So I hope everybody's doing well in these difficult times. Um, as Noel mentioned, I'm going to address the the issues and the implications of surveillance approaches from a United States perspective. Um, Noel, what should I do to see the slides? Should I? Uh, share screen. There's a green button. Button share screen. Can you see it? Oh, okay. I thought you were gonna pull them up. Okay. No, no. Um, All yours. Okay. So let me. I'm gonna need to get my then. Um, okay. Sorry for the slight delay here. No worry. So as Noel just um, mentioned, I recently moved from the United States to the UK and it's been interesting seeing how, um, how different surveillance for diabetes is conducted in different parts of the world, but also how it's evolving so quickly over time. Um, before coming to the UK, I did work for 20 years at CDC and about the last 10 of those, let me see, hopefully you can see this coming up here. If not, I found your slides. If you prefer, I can show them from. Uh, 
Sure. Will I be able to 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 um, forward them if you pull them up? Okay. That would be great if you could pull them up. No problem. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to address diabetes surveillance in the United States, and you know I think that as you all are aware. You know, we're all aware of the, the big increases in prevalence. We've heard about this in, in our other talks affecting virtually all parts of the world. But I think what you've seen in from the prior three talks is that with the growth and proliferation of, of data sources, our attention to how to use them well, that surveillance can really tell us a whole lot more about epidemics and what is happening and how to manage it. Um, am I able to forward from here on, Noel? No, but just tell me next slide. Okay, go ahead, next, yep. And so, but I think that, go ahead and, what we see when we look kind of beneath, beneath the surface, if you could go back one, Noel, um, that when we look at the epidemic, diabetes, like all chronic conditions, there's much more than prevalence, the story. And what we see here is that we see many dynamic heterogeneous aspects of it. We see successes and failures and care and impact. We see that our perspective um, and our conclusions are affected by our time horizon. If we look over the short term versus the long term, um, you heard from Yako about emerging and non-traditional complications, things, cancers. Um, it's not just about microvascular and macrovascular and neuropathic. And we actually see that all of these things affect the character of the population. And all of this has impl implications for trade-offs and choices for care and prevention. I think this is why this is so important. Um, next slide, please. And so what I'll do right now is I'm gonna give you a brief overview of, of how the US national surveillance system has was constructed and what it exists of. I'll give you an overview of, of what its long-term findings are, what those implications are and how it's changing the character. And then finally, some recent changes, unexpected and, and actually some concerning that um, implications for all of us in science and in clinical care. Next slide, please. So the US system, we're not fortunate like Finland, for example, to have a national registry. There is no single registry. And the US system that is managed by Centers for Disease Control really consists of um, compiling and aggregating different sources that do different things. So for example, it uses household and examination surveys for some of the things like prevalence, care, risk factor management. It uses hospitalization data to assess incidence of complications. It uses telephone and school surveys for things like behavior factors. It uses registries for things that we can't measure well with those other sources, such as renal disease or diabetes in youth, for example, and then vital statistics. And so what the system involves really is integrating and standardizing as much as possible across those different contributing parts. Um, but overall, this is all, although it's not, um, it has limitations, it's done a nice job of describing the overall picture. Um, next slide, please. And what it does, um, let me move on past this slide in the, in, in the interest of time, um, except to say briefly, it measures disease burden, we track modifiable risk factors, and ultimately we're trying to understand whether evidence-based interventions are being um, provided to the population and ultimately looking at safety concerns and harms of treatment. Next slide, please. We can also think about our metrics in surveillance across the continuum of risk, right? And we know that um, depending on our focus, we can focus our prevention on among those with complications, reducing risk of disability and death. Um, among those with diabetes, reducing risk of complications. Among those with prediabetes, reducing risk of diabetes. And then in the general population, reducing risk factors. And as a whole, the surveillance indicators have tended to evolve from the right side to the left side. You know, I think that we've been able to go and, and um, indicators of burden, for example, those indicators of, of um, complications, we tend to pull from hospitalization or vital statistics. Preventive care practices and risk factors for complications, which you see in the middle part of the screen, we tend to have to rely upon surveys and increasingly health systems electronic data sources 
to measure those. And then, and then the other area to consider is primary prevention, which we tend to require surveys for these as well. And, but I think, um, as you all know, the data environment is evolving very rapidly with many, many different sorts. So I think in the future, we're gonna see that what we use in diabetes surveillance is gonna become more diverse, but also perhaps more challenging um, than it was 20 years ago when we were relying mostly on surveys and cohorts to understand things. Um, next slide, please. So, and this is just a, a list of some of the ways that I think the, the sources and ultimately the metrics for diabetes surveillance are changing. Health systems data, for example. Now this is something that Yako described, they've really been doing in Finland for decades, but this is newer for many other places to use available health systems data as our source. Electronic medical records and, and bigger data, mobile data, um, non-health data, for example, geographic information. And then we're also seeing an evolution of the way data is organized um, to provide efficient um, analyses while also pulling from different um, sources. And then I think we're seeing good systems also coming up with good ways of visualizing data and providing tools and calculators so that it's not just epidemiologists, trained epidemiologists and clinicians who know who can use these systems, but they're more accessible to different uh, segments and you know, partners that we work with. So next slide. So let me take you into just basically what we found from this system, some of the big findings. Um, this shows when we assembled data about five years ago to take a long look at how diabetes complications have changed in the United States. And this was a, an analysis that really gave us good news. And we found between 1995 and to the year 2010, there were actually quite large reductions in a number of diabetes complications. And that's what you see there. This is the US population with diabetes. And you can see that, for example, macrovascular complications declined by about 50%, amputations by about 40%, end stage renal disease declined by the least, but even that did have an improvement overall as did hyperglycemic death. Um, next progression, please. And when we look at um, more closely at this, we see, of course, that reductions were greatest in macrovascular disease. We, what you don't see on this slide, though, is that there was a large narrowing of the age-related difference. In other words, this decrease across most of these outcomes was really driven by the oldest segment of the population. Um, and that's part good, but it's part bad. And, and what it sort of hides is that young adults really have not fared that well. They've not improved as much. Um, and in general, in the U.S. at least, the disparities or the inequalities by social class still remain. Um, everybody improved, but there was not a narrowing of that difference. And the other thing I think we should always remember when we're looking at a big picture like this, averages can hide the variation. So you can have a reduction overall, but you can have main, big sub-segments of the population who are not improving. And we don't really have the data so well in the United States to tell us where that is for complications. Um, next slide, please. Um, there's speculation about what has led to all these decreases, but in general, we think it's due to different factors. It's improvements in risk factor management. We have data to support that. Integrated care, improved self-care. Um, and then there's medical advances that have made a difference. And then perhaps also policies, including oh, tobacco policies, as well as changes to the food environment that have helped to some extent. So next slide. So alongside those reductions in complications, we've also seen big reductions in mortality among the diabetic population. And this shows the overall uh, reductions in death rates, about a 40% reduction during that period of time. But one of the things you'll note here is if you look at the causes, that the virtually all of that decrease was explained by those with um, a reduction in vascular, basically by the reduction in vascular causes. That's the part in blue. And that vascular causes went from in prior decades to accounting for about half of all deaths. Now they only account for about a third of the deaths. And in the meantime, cancers and non-vascular, non-cancer causes really did not change over time. But what that means is that proportionately, 
There are many more. It's a more diverse set of causes of death that are affecting people with diabetes. And now if you animate next slide, you'll see that when we look at those other causes, many of those really are causes that are very related to diabetes. There are things like renal disease, septicemia, accidents, flu pneumonia, um, lung diseases, liver diseases. And so these are causes that diabetes is affecting. They're not declining and proportionately they're playing a bigger role. Next slide. And the other thing we should point out is that many of these cancers that are causing deaths are also diabetes related. So the, the point here is that what this surveillance has shown us is that vascular diseases are still a problem, a big problem for us, but we have to think more broadly about what we're trying to prevent in terms of complications when we manage diabetes. Next slide, please. So um, the other thing that's, that is uh, one of the other sort of sub stories here is that because the decreases in complications are greater for older adults, it means that actually young and middle-aged adults are proportionally taking on a bigger portion of complications. So in a given health system or a given community, if you add up those complications that exist out in the population, it's more likely to be young and middle-aged adults. Now, older adults are, are still accounting for a lot because they're living longer and longer with diabetes, more years with diabetes. But these pie graphs just sort of demonstrate if you look in the yellow and, um, excuse, excuse me, the blue and the red segments of the pies, you can see how that across many of these different types, young and middle-aged adults are taking a bigger proportion. Next slide. Um, so that's the story for complications. In general, it's good, it has been good news over the long term. Um, in the meantime, as you know, prevalence and incidence. So incidence on the left side increased in the United States like many places, and then prevalence increased as well. If you look though around 2009, 2010 though, you can see there's a change. Um, incidence started to decline and prevalence plateaued. Now, if mortality is decreasing, that would make sense that you would see that prevalence um, plateaus after incidence decreases. In other words, you'd have a reduction in new cases, but those cases who you already, that already existed are living longer, so they keep prevalence a bit higher. Now, what explained this change around 2009, 2010? And if you animate this, Noel, I have some suggestions for you. We really don't know for sure. This is a bit, Yako was referring to this as well. Um, around 2009, it could be that, well, we've had some reduction in risk factors. Um, obesity had plateaued a bit at that point. Prevention had gotten more attention. Maybe those are the things that are driving this. On the other hand, hemoglobin A1C was also, um, the use of it was increasing. The policy recommending using it started in 2010 and hemoglobin A1C would select a smaller segment of the population. It's a bit less sensitive. Um, and there could have been changes in screening and diagnosis that we don't know about. The assumption is that screening and diagnosis has increased, but there's not actually direct data that tells us that. Um, if you look over at the prevalence side and animate that in a while. So, um, this again could be due to longer lifespans and fewer new diagnoses. So in any event, we're not really sure. Um, we think that personally, I think that this is a combination of a peak and a decrease in real incidence, but I suspect that part of this decrease is due to the change to hemoglobin uh, A1C as a diagnostic tool. Next slide, please. Um, now that's the adult population. And even if there is a decrease there, We've not seen that decrease in youth yet that I'm aware of. Now, this slide is a bit old at this point, but the SEARCH study is a reminder. This is our the most comprehensive study in the United States to look at type 2 diabetes in youth. And as you probably read before, there have been large increases that does depend somewhat on race ethnicity. You see the largest increases have been in Native Americans and non-Hispanic Blacks. Um, Virtually all groups except non-Hispanic whites have seen an increase in type two diabetes in youth. And other data from the search study has shown that when um, youth 
or for that matter, young adult, develop type 2 diabetes, they have a very high prevalence of complications or at least risk factors for complications very early in their disease. So this is a big, um, this is a, um, a big problem for the future with people developing a condition so early in life that does its damage over time. So next slide. So briefly to summarize the long-term view, the epidemiologic profile has looked a bit like this. We've seen this decrease in complications overall. Put this blue arrow there to remind us that there still is a large excess risk of all these complications. And that since most people do not get the ideal care um, that they could, there's still a lot that could be done to further reduce that. But while we've seen that decrease in complications, we've seen this increase and incidence and prevalence evident from the, the US surveillance system. Next slide. So let me turn though to the more recent past um, and maybe the future, so new directions. So after we published that, we continued on our job and we started to look again at amputations with newer data. And what we noticed that after 2010, if you look here on the right side, the top panel is lower extremity amputations in people with diabetes. And the blue is total amputations. The gray is uh, um, minor, as in, well, foot and, and below the ankle, and then the red is, is above the ankle. But what you see is that there's a distinct increase overall, particularly in the minor amputations, but the major amputations plateaued as well. The lower part of the screen is people without diabetes. But this is, of course, really concerning, led to a lot of questions about why you would see this. Is this really due to worse management? Is this because surgeons have changed their approaches for, for doing amputations when they have a bad foot ulcer? You know, what would explain this? Not totally sure, but we, we, this led us to look back at our other data. And if you go to the next slide, Noel, this is a follow-up analysis that we did using that same set of complications I described earlier by age um, with the more recent data through 2015. And what you see here is, and if you go ahead and animate this, Noel, I have a bunch of, um, uh, what you see is that young adults is really where the big increase has been. Uh, keep going there. And then in middle age, you see increases in amputations, in hyperglycemia, and MI, and then you see plateaus in end-stage renal disease. And then in older adults, you see that although they're not increases, we see that all the improvements have stopped. So um, this is, a, this is uh, really concerning. It suggests at least in young adults, all those gains from the previous decades had been basically erased in a fairly short period of time. Um, now, what would explain this? Um, let's go to the next slide, if you could. So, well, there's a variety of possibilities here. And I'm sorry, I'm sharing a bunch of other examples here just to point out that we've, we've seen some other um, evidence of the same issues. The bottom left shows um, hospitalizations for infections. The, the, the upper right corner shows hyperglycemic crisis. And the lower right shows us that across different cardiovascular outcomes, there was a plateau that occurred. So there's, the point is there's lots of pieces of evidence that suggest that, that the improvements have stalled and perhaps even started to resurge in, in the recent decades. You animate this, I've, again, I've cited what I think are some of the possible explanations. Next slide. Okay, so I think we have to look at a variety of things. We, in epidemiology and surveillance, we always wanna think about measurement factors. Are there coding changes? We don't think so. We've looked for everything we can here to under, to, that could possibly explain that. Now, changing denominator is a possibility, and we think that is a factor in the US, in particular, perhaps partly because of the switch to hemoglobin A1C, we are, um, have a decrease in incidence and essentially we have a population who has longer duration of disease now than they used to. They're living a bit longer. Um, and if you look at the distribution of duration of disease, you see that there are more people who've had long duration diabetes and that's partly what is driving 
this increase. So it means that in communities and clinical settings that the average patients have had the disease longer, more likely to have complications. But we also have to think about whether there are practice or provider factors driving this perhaps stalling in, in preventive care. And there's some evidence of that, that risk factors like um, blood pressure, lipids, and A1C have not continued to improve in the last decade as much. There may be individual factors. And then there may be political and social factors. We're reminded that um, we had, we have new health system changes in the US around 2010. Um, we have a great recession that affected the US in 2010. And that affected much of the world as well. And maybe it's not a coincidence that the, that, the, um, that the increase actually in mortality rates or, or the, um, the reduction in the improvement in mortality rates in middle-aged men that has been seen in the US is also somehow consistent with what we're seeing for diabetes. Next slide. Now, when we talk about a major um, shock to the system like the recession was in 2010, we can't avoid thinking about COVID as well. And so we're COVID this year, of course, is going to have all sorts of implications for our surveillance. It's going to have certainly have measurement problems, understanding measurement um, rates from 2018 to 2022 is going to be very complicated for all of us. I don't quite know how we're going to tackle that yet. But I think that's, and there are certainly a lot of questions about the relationship with COVID that I think in very soon and really we're tackling now with surveillance is how do we um, examine this, on, how do we understand the relationship of diabetes to COVID-19 and for that matter, other infections. Um, the most common questions that we read about are the questions about direct effects, right? How does diabetes influence infection? Why and how much does diabetes affect COVID progression and outcomes? To what degree is that really explained by obesity or where people live or socioeconomic status as opposed to diabetes intrinsically and glucose? But the less asked questions that I think are equally important um, are, especially since I think we all recognize that COVID is not gonna be, um, it's gonna be with us for a while, what are the collateral effects on diabetes care and management? What is the impact of COVID-related isolation on health behaviors, mental health, care, loneliness, and related risk? What's the impact of the shift to remote care? Now, there may be some benefits. Um, may there, and it may be that some of the changes, with some of the aspects of isolation, some people actually get healthier, but we think um, these are all unknowns. And what's the impact, the net impact on diabetes related control and outcomes? Uh, next slide, please. So let me just um, summarize that when we look at this newer data, we look at this profile has changed a bit. We see this a bit of an upshift in complications and a bit of a downshift in incidence and prevalence. But um, I think as you've seen, the story is even much more complex than that. Next slide. And so with that, let me just summarize and conclude here. When we look at long-term dynamics, we see a change in character of diabetes-related morbidity, um, including reduction in mass macrovascular disease in particular, driven by older populations. We see a diversification and relative of, of outcomes and, a, and an increased relative importance of things like renal disease, disability, cancers, infections, multimorbidity. Next slide. And we see some persistent growing divides or inequalities. We see a resurgent concern, we see concerns about a resurgence in complications, particularly in young adults. We see a greater age divide. And what I mean by that is that we see that young people are not, they're falling behind relative to older people, I think. And we see persistent income divides. Um, this is within the United States. Um, but that divide is even greater when you look between high income countries and low income countries. So um, in terms of data, access to data, care and outcomes. Um, and that's it for me. So I'm um, once again, it's been great to be part of this symposium. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Ed. Uh, wonderful presentation. And thank you to all four speakers for their excellent presentation. I think it really summarized very well the current evidence and shows what's the way in the diabetes surveillance and monitoring with all your experience. And definitely it helps for all the participating organizations. Um, we have about 10, 15 minutes for questions. And there's some of you prefer there's also you can type answers in the Q&A box to answer some of the questions but um, let me start with one the first question that we have here the from Drona Razali for IACO in about the North Karelia project so North Karelia project was launched in the 1970s as you well aware as you are the basically the the brain or the founder of this project to reduce the burden of chronic diseases why is that this area still has high rate of, rate of diabetes? Has the prevention initiative there failed? Now, <clears throat> briefly, at the time when we started in the North Karelia project, the highest mortality from coronary heart disease was in the middle-aged men. They were lean, they were lumberjacks, they consumed seven to 8,000 kilocalories a day in working in the woods, incredible. They were fit. There was no obesity. There was no lack of physical activity. And therefore, uh, these were not part of the North Karelia project. We were concentrating on a high fat diet they consumed because they needed uh, calories. Smoking was 70% at that time uh, in, in men. And uh, uh, because uh, there was no uh, uh, freezers, refrigerators, except in the winter time in the woods, uh, then uh, the, f the meat and fish were salted. Salt intake was incredibly high. So all these things uh, were related to diet and, uh, and other factors. Afterwards, we realized that we have to pay attention uh, to the increase in uh, obesity and, and also we did a surveys already in the 1980s showing that in North Karelia, the prevalence of diabetes in the, in the people over 85 years of age was more than 25%. And it was exactly the same in, in, in the other parts of Finland. So, Obviously, there has been something uh, which uh, we can now call the fetal programming or whatever has happened in, in the past. Uh, people who lived very healthy life, otherwise, they may develop diabetes because their beta cells are so weak. They, they, they cannot tolerate by the end of their, their time. But Good news is that if you get the diabetes at the age of 85, it doesn't cause any complications. Thank you very much, Yeah. Um. Eres Noelia Avanzar o hacemos una pregunta para, en español para hacer un switch, ¿vale? Okay, I will switch to Spanish. Eh, una pregunta para el doctor Pablo Asner. Doctor Pablo, eh, le dice Juan Pablo Pérez Bedoya de la Universidad de Antioquia. Eh, muchas gracias por su conferencia y las recomendaciones. Y nos pregunta, según su experiencia, ¿qué indicadores considera claves para la vigilancia, el monitoreo y el control de la diabetes tipo 1 en nuestra población colombiana? Pues... Um... Gracias. Para la diabetes tipo 1, eh, obviamente es importante el, los indicadores que nos permitan establecer eh, en el tiempo qué está pasando con la incidencia. Eh, hasta ahora lo único que hemos podido hacer es estudios, eh, eh, dos estudios realmente usando la metodología de captura-recaptura, que es la misma que figura en los estudios que se incluyeron en Diamond, del cual formamos parte. Eh, esta, esto lo único que nos indicó el segundo estudio que lo acabamos de publicar es que pareciera haber aumentado la, pre, la, 
perdón, la incidencia de diabetes tipo 1, eh, quizás duplicado la incidencia, pero es tan amplia la, la el, digamos, la, la confiabilidad es tan baja debido a la enorme cantidad de fuentes de información que no nos permite eh, dar ese, o sea, asegurar eso con suficiente precisión. Por eso, un registro nos podría indicar los, el, el, realmente la tendencia en la incidencia. Obviamente, todo lo que han mostrado los panelistas respecto a complicaciones de la, de la diabetes tipo 1 y su relación con el grado de control y con el tiempo de evolución es clave documentarlo. Eh, hay que hacer una eh, búsqueda sistemática o una, un, un, digamos, una... Eh, una, una serie de exámenes sistemáticos para ir documentando esas complicaciones. Eh, y bueno, eh, en principio con esos datos, si fueran confiables y suficientes, al igual que los de, como ya dije, complicaciones y mortalidad, pues tendríamos una buena base para poder entenderlos. Eh, ya vimos lo que pasa con el control de la diabetes medido por hemoglobina glicosilada. Creo que ese es un un dato fundamental. Eh, yo creo que Ed mostró las diferentes fuentes y los diferentes datos que podemos recabar. Lo único es que en nuestro medio, como ya mostré, eh, las fuentes que vienen de, de las cuentas de alto costo y de otras fuentes de, del Ministerio de Salud tienen el problema de que no son completas y no son del todo confiables. Muchísimas gracias, doctor Pablo. Eh, bueno, estamos en mora de, de verdad volver a entender un poco esa metodología de captura, recaptura propuesta por la aporte y de verdad empezar a mirar quizá en el marco de nuestro proyecto Refreca que tenemos socios en diferentes países, valdría la pena de verdad empezar otra vez a rescatar esa metodología que fue tan valiosa para Diamond, para Eurodiab y que quedó un poco suspendida en el tiempo. Entonces yo creo que es hora de que estos esfuerzos nos ayuden a colaborar y a avanzar. Cedo la palabra al profesor Noel para quizá una última pregunta o dos. Gracias, profesor. Gracias. I think we have time for one last question and actually for Catherine and Ed. And Matías Villatoro, he asks, what's the current experience about type 2, 2 diabetes patient registry that have like controlled diseases? So probably a registry about controlled type 2 diabetes. And uh, maybe Catherine first and then Ed. Uh, honestly, I, I'm not aware about uh, type 2 diabetes register. Uh, at least in Germany, there is no such register. Uh, I know that there are some registers in Scandinavian countries, um, but I, I cannot say about if it helps somehow to control diabetes because it's a clinical question. It's, it's a relationship between a doctor and a patient, I think. Good. Thank you. I had something to add. Yeah, so I think that actually, if you look at, in, in my mind, the places in the world that have the best situation with this are Scandinavian countries. It's, it's like Finland, Denmark, Sweet, the Swedes, amazing, wherein they can collect in a full population. And really, they tend to pull from four sources. It's um, primary care, electronic medical record, hospitalization, laboratory, and pharmacy. And then ideally, they even bring in surveys so they get patient um, you know, outcomes and behaviors that are important to patients. But they, they do that very well. And they ultimately do it with two purposes. One is for monitoring and surveillance, but they also use it as a direct feedback tool for clinicians. Now, places within the United States do this very well, Kaiser Permanente and you know, primary care that a national or state level, they don't do it well. In Canada, you see it done very nicely in the provinces and there are other places as well. It sounds like it's evolving in Colombia as well. But I think that's the, that is really what ultimately um, we should have these data systems exist, but they're not easy to put together for the purposes of registries. I think that that's what the, the world is sort of moving towards. The question is how we do it efficiently, cheaply in a way that we can interpret well. Thank you. Finland is much more than just Kimi yep. and, and Can I 
Can I, can I come, come in between? Yeah. Uh, in Finland, we, we do have these uh, databases and we have used uh, extensively uh, for certain things uh, cancer registers in 1954 and um, type 1 diabetes data uh, due to insulin uh, uh, reimbursement since 1965. It's an unbelievable um, uh, amount of information. Of course, uh, we have to scrutinize all these things. Uh, the uh, cancer register has to evaluate every single case, case by case, whether it's a real cancer or not and uh, whether it's primary cancer or not. So we did in the beginning uh, in type one diabetes register as well, went through all the records, whether it's real type one diabetes or not, uh, whether it's uh, some other disease, uh, the secondary diabetes, type two diabetes, whatever. And uh, it requires a huge amount of work. Uh, but today, uh, in, in our country, because of a medical education includes uh, the aspects of, of data collection. Already in my time, when I graduated in 1973, we had ICD-8 diagnosis in our brain. So we had to diagnose every single patient in a hospital with the ICD code. And, and so it has been going on. You have to teach also doctors and other people to, to take care of a good quality data. And this is something which is missing in the most part of the world. Uh, I don't know why in, in this part of the world we have to obey because we have a winter, we can have a fireplace, but still if you go outside, <laughs> it's pretty cold. <laughs> so, <laughs> You, you, you need to balance between what you are doing and, and what you can, what you can't. So uh, today we have this fantastic database, but it has taken more than 10 years to build up. In the future, I think it will be a really, really a great thing uh, to, to use. But Ed, like you said, well, data, data, there are factors behind the data and we should understand why the things are changing in our data and what are the factors responsible for changes. We cannot take it for granted that something goes down or something goes up that it is due to one factor. No, we have to understand better. We are scientists and we have to take lead in that. Thank you very much, Jaco. This actually is a very nice conclusion remarks for our webinar. And I would like to thank, uh, first of all, sorry for everybody who couldn't answer their questions. Time was a little bit limited, we're already over time, but it was, um, you can always contact us or the speakers by getting more information. I would like to thank all of you for participating, for accepting our invitation. This was a, a great success. We had a lot of participants today, and I hope this got improved as well, the surveillance systems in the regions. I also like to thank very much the University of Antioquia for all setting this up for the translators, for the team, uh, also at Paula and, and in Silena, for the design, the graphics, the distribution of information, or Carlos for the platform organizing everything and everybody else I've forgotten to say thank you. Finally, thanks also to one of the core organization, the Epidemiology and Public Health Interest Group of the American Diabetes Association. It's a pleasure to be part of that group. So I think great job and thanks for the support. Um, unless Lucia Paula has some final words in Spanish. Um, maybe in thank in Spanish, no, maybe we, we just, one or two minutes for Dr. Catherine, maybe she wants also to say uh, something at the very end. So I les digo muchas gracias y cedo la palabra a la doctora Catherine para que también haga un cierre y terminemos con ella. Muchas gracias a todos. Doctora Catherine, uh, last word. <laughs> It was very unexpected. Uh, thank you very much. It was. 
excellent, excellent uh, seminar. I, I really enjoyed it. I think, I, I think it's very important to, to talk about diabetes violence. And today we see different examples of how it can be done. Thank you very much. Thank you. The, for a point of information, we have recorded the webinar. Within a week, probably will be made available. We're going to send the link to the webinar recording to all registered participants by email, so we get the information pretty soon. And finally, if you want to follow what, what Omnet does, you have like the social networks, the Facebook, Twitter, and the web page of Omnet if you want to get more information and be informed. Thank you very much to everybody. Have a great weekend. Enjoy Friday. Maybe if some of you already have started Saturday, let me know. So enjoy it and thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Una feliz tarde y un feliz fin de semana. Hasta luego. Have a nice skiing. <laughs> have a nice costume. You, you see, Ed, uh, Finland is much more than just Santa Claus and Nokia and Kimi Raikkonen. Eh? <laughs>